morning. You are with the uh, the House Government Operations and Judiciary Committees. Um, we are reconvening here this morning to uh, to continue our deliberations on S two nineteen um, and one nineteen. Um, we have heard from a number of witnesses over the last couple of days, um, and that, and I also wanted to draw the both committees' attention to the fact that there is um, there's a set of testimony that is available electronically uh, from people who either weren't able to be here or submitted supplementary testimony. So, um, to in an email to both committees, um, we. We have uh, testimony from Coach Christie, and um, hopefully that has been put up on the committee's pages. Uh, there's also an email to both committees from Topher Woods, um, and there's a, a bulleted list of um, suggestions in, in, contained in that email. And then Bor Yang um, made reference to uh, to electronic testimony that she was submitting, and that is um, that came via email um, to yesterday. And so hopefully that can be up on the committee pages as well. Um, so it occurs to me that yesterday, uh, just as we were um, finishing and preparing to go back to the floor, we, we had just finished testimony from James Pepper and we had not given either committee an opportunity to ask him questions. Um, and so uh, since he's with us this morning, um, I guess I, I wanted to uh, invite him if he had any other any other thoughts to say to to spark conversation or invite committee members to jump in with a raised hand? So good morning, Pepper. Good morning. Thank you. For the record, James Pepper, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, you know, I made it through the bills, uh, both bills rather quickly yesterday. Um, I, I don't have any additional comments on either of them. Um, and, you know, I guess just to summarize, just very broadly, uh, we are supportive of S-119, S-219, um, with the exception of, uh, you know, we'd like to see some modification of, I believe it's section five of S-219, which is the new um, unlawful you, or uh, law enforcement use of a prohibited restraint crime. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you go back to that last comment you made? I know we talked, a, you talked a little bit about it yesterday, but I'm, I'm, I'm not clear. Are we talking about section five? Um, that's right. I'm looking at section five of S219. I'm looking at draft 3.1 and I believe it begins on page seven. Okay, so uh, help me out. What's your recommendation? Is it to take out B, to modify B, or is it to take out the whole section or modify the whole section? Well, I think that this section is both under-inclusive in that it really doesn't talk about um, a lot of police misconduct um, that is maybe fall short of the the kind of aggravated assault intentionality standard. You know, if someone repeatedly uses a taser on an individual recklessly, um, you know, that would might be misconduct, but it wouldn't be covered under this crime and it wouldn't be covered under aggravated assault necessarily. If someone repeatedly uses a baton um, uh, recklessly, um, then that wouldn't be covered. Um, it's also over-inclusive in that it, um, it's a, essentially a strict liability crime um, where a prosecutor you know, sees a use of a chokehold, um, they're required to charge that. And then it's up to a jury to determine whether there's an affirmative defense that's eligible to this officer. Um, you know, for an aggravated assault, a, a 
a prosecutor would look at things like is self-defense, is there evidence that this person was defending themselves? Because that would undercut uh, the intentionality of that crime, the strict, the, the specific uh, intent that's required, that the prosecutor is required to prove. There's no specific intent here. So the prosecutor would charge it and then it would be up to the officer to, to show, to prove by a preponderance of evidence that they were acting in self-defense. So to me, you know, this, this section just needs a little bit of work. Um, and our state's attorneys actually have some recommendations, but I think that, you know, given the time frame that we're talking about, I think it would be wise for us to vet it through a, a broader um, group of stakeholders before we move forward. But uh, I mean, our, our concerns are that, first of all, you know, there are crimes that cover this. I, I mentioned aggravated assault. Uh, um, certainly some of the homicide statutes, depending on, on the level of intent and what the outcome was. But um, this crime doesn't seem to, to really hit at what, what, doesn't seem to hit at the problem that we have. Um, so, or the problem that's being tried to be solved. Okay, so you're, you're possibly have some suggested tweaks to it but you don't have those now. I don't have. I don't have them vetted through the proper channels in my own department. Um, but we do have some recommendations that I that I could give the committee if they want to look at it um, uh, in a little bit. Um, that would be great because I believe we may be on a very short timeline. Um, I mean, we have three bills. I'm not sure what the game plan is, and whether we can do uh, justice to all three bills all at one time in, in a couple of days, or whether we ponder some of this and make some, um, as some of the folks that have testified to uh, finish this uh, a little bit later when we come back. Um, the other question I had for is, uh, several people have suggested that the body cams, um, we should preface that with a policy first uh, before we just give everyone a body cam and say, we did it. Um, do the state's attorneys have any uh, thoughts on that section, section six? Um, I absolutely agree with the idea of having a policy and I, I say that as the public records officer for the Department of State's attorneys, you know, the public records law says that anyone who is the custodian of a record um, has to comply with the public records laws. Um, and, you know, these body cam footage, uh, you know, sometimes a local, the police department has it, sometimes Vermont State Police has it, sometimes the prosecutor's office have it. And we're all trying to coordinate with one another on the redactions. Um, and, you know, it's just, when you're gonna create a massive amount of public records, it would be very wise to think about how are you gonna, how are you gonna give those over to the public in a reasonable and timely manner? And so if, if you have, if you just say everyone tomorrow flip on your body cameras 100% of the time, um, and you, know, you have a stop where someone's in the midst of a mental health crisis or someone is, giving a police officer, you know, confidential information. It, it's just, uh, you know, within 10 days, you know, according to the public rec records law, and, and I know those timelines aren't, aren't uh, strictly adhered to always, but within 10 days, that's a public record. Um, so I would very much uh, support the idea of getting kind of a overarching policy in place, um, you know, many we're dealing with this now and um so i, I don't want to stand in the way of you know this provision because we are supportive of it um and body cameras make prosecutors lives a lot easier uh, very mm -hmm. often um they help uh they, they they're very helpful and a very helpful tool in um building public confidence in, in our police so um, we're supportive of the section, but I, I would agree with your point um, about the overarching policy. Who should develop that policy? Um, I, I think certainly a group of stakeholders, including the ACLU. The ACLU, as you know, was um, 
very much involved with the Doyle versus City of Burlington Police Department decision um, regarding uh, public access to body camera footage and not just body camera footage, but all public records. Um, they certainly have an understanding and expertise in the issue. Um, I think the Secretary of State's office has, has a legitimate um, interest in public records. Um, so, I mean, it would have to be just a, a broad range of people getting together and deciding, you know, what's in the public interest. Um, and, you know, of course, the Vermont Press Association um, has a strong interest. Um, the, it's something that I think that, you know, as long as we all know what's to be expected, um, the more clarity we have on the front end, the better. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Nader. Thank you. Uh, James, my, my question, are you, are you able to tell me if, if an officer is found to have committed a misdemeanor or a felony, is there a statutory requirement that a prosecutor who doesn't already have a professional relationship with that officer investigate the case like from an adjacent county or anything like that just to avoid any sort of bias um there's no a prosecutor doesn't have to um conflict out of a case um it, in practice i would say they almost always would but uh no there's nothing in statute that would require you know if there's a why if there's a investigation um, into a Washington County officer where the state's attorney decides to bring charges that that state's attorney would then send it over to an adjacent county. There's no requirement. Thank you. I think that Martin's next. Uh, yeah, just a couple of follow-up questions uh, to Representative Harrison's questions. Uh, he asked actually most of the ones that I wanted to ask. Thank you, Jim. Um, so the policy with respect to the uh, video recording devices, the body cameras, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the access to those records under the public records law and such. Wouldn't, wouldn't that policy, and I guess this is sounding like a leading question, which I suppose it is, but wouldn't that policy also need to address when and where uh, the body cameras uh, can be used by officers and and related to public records, it's not just who can access, but retention policies, how long certain types of, of uh, interactions that have been recorded should be retained, et cetera. It seems to be more than just an access question. Is, is that correct? Or, or do you think that's covered elsewhere? The, the, it, the answer is yes, uh, <clears throat> absolutely yes. Uh, and I think a lot of the record retention you know, every department is required to develop a record retention policy with the Secretary of State. I'm not sure that every department has. Um, I know our, I know the state's the Department of State's Attorneys has has one. It's it's available on the Secretary of State's website. Um, but it, absolutely, um, you know, th those are the types of questions. I know storage is becoming less and less of a financial burden on departments, um, but that it's something that um, should be worked out on the front end course. But also, I guess the, the when and where, for instance, we may not want law enforcement to uh, turn on their body cameras at all in certain spaces, such as uh, elementary schools, such as our schools, just generally, there's a lot of talk about SROs and not wanting SROs, but at a minimum, uh, probably don't want them to have their cameras on, possibly. I mean, that's just an issue or surreptitiously recording, etc. I think there's, should be those kind of standards should be part of a policy, don't you think? Yeah, and and you know, there might be an instance where it's it's required to be at school, but maybe you know you can blur out everything but you know the the non confidential information. If you look at the if you look at the tape that was the subject matter of the Doyle versus Burlington um, case, you can see that you know the vast majority of the background is blurred out because there are a lot of juveniles involved in that in that body cam footage. So you, you also, you mentioned the different stakeholders that should be involved as far as putting the policy together, but who should we tell to put this policy together? What overarching organization or, or group uh, should run this show? You know, I, the you Secretary of State's office is the, has the, is, has the, you know, Vermont 
uh, archivist, and they're the ones that are ultimately, they're the ones that we work our record retention policy. Uh, we negotiate with them what that is. And it seems to me that they're the right ones. I hate to volunteer um, them, but I, I just. But if we're, if, if we're, we're going to ask for not just the record issue, but the when and how the body cameras should be used, that seems to be much broader. And I'm just wondering if there's a, which organization should oversee the development of the policy. Maybe you don't have an answer, but that's, I mean, I think it's broader than just the records issue. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that uh, off the top of my head, I'm sorry. All right, I appreciate it, thanks. Marsha Gardner. Thank you. Um, could you tell me what your group thinks about qualified immunity? So uh, I'm the wrong person to ask that. I, you know, I represent the state's attorneys um, and qualified immunity is really a civil issue. Um, and so I would, I would defer to the attorney general's office, um, the civil division there. I think they would probably be the, the best witness to talk about qualified immunity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, John Gannon. So following up on Martin's question about who should be in charge of this, um, per, do you think it perhaps there should be a report back to the legislature with respect to a policy around body cams, um, just so that we make sure that all constituencies have had input into the process? Um, I, I think ultimately um, getting the legislative approval, stamp of approval, or just development with legislators is, is, is ultimately going to be the, the best way to get this done. So a, a legislator maybe putting together a stakeholder group and then having uh, submit recommendations. Um, you know, I, other states I'm sure have these, I'm sure the ACLU could list a number of states uh, off the top of their head that have these policies in place. So I don't think it would take a, an incredible amount of time for a stakeholder group to put together a, a solid recommendation for the for this committee and, and your counterparts in the Senate to approve. Yeah, no, I don't I don't think it would take that long. I've been taking a look at um, ACLU's model policy um, and it addresses many of the issues that, that Martin's raised like record retention. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a very good starting point. I, I just wanna make sure that if there, that every constituency that has input is listened to, um, because I think that's one of the criticisms that we have if, if we handed this off to the Department of Public Safety, um, that they may not take into account or address all the concerns of everyone. Yeah, that's a great point, yep. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think I have a question for this witness. I think I'll probably direct something to Bryn when everybody is finished. Okay. Um, I think that that's all the hands that I see at the moment. If other folks um, want to jump in with a question, uh, now is the time. Just want to say thank um, you, James. Thank you. Really helpful. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, we appreciate you spending some time with us. Um, very much. Uh, just for both committees to know, I um, I have asked our committee assistant to see if the Secretary of State's office could uh, send someone at noon to talk with us about body cam policy. Um, I think m since the bill contemplates moving forward uh, fairly directly with body cams, uh, I think it's worthwhile making sure that we understand how to launch a process to uh, to create the data storage policy that needs to go along with that. Um, so I think at this point, um, we have about 30 minutes left and it would be um, a, a good time for us to, I think, narrow our focus a bit and look at bill language. Um, since we have, uh, we have heard more um, peaceful, Feelings about 219. I think we're going to concentrate on that one at the moment. And, um, you know, this is a lot to 
a lot to bite off uh, in a short period of time, but, um, but narrowing our focus to the different components of 219 um, might make the most sense. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, Jim, I put my hand down myself. Um, Bryn, on 219-2407 sub A, um, who, who represents the council? Do they have a signed council themselves? Are they an entity? Are they under the attorney general's office? Who advances any legal action that they take? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to confirm the answer with Betsy Ann. I, my guess is that they have their own counsel, but I would need to confirm. So in that section, which of course I just lost because I clicked on something, um, it looks like if a law enforcement officer commits a category B first offense, they can be dealt with on the local level, whether that's uh, deemed mm, acceptable or not, they can have the, uh, everything dismissed. But then the council then has the ability to take up the person who observed it but did nothing on that level, say for the excessive use of force. That seems a bit incongruous. Um, yes, you, you, you have identified a, an incongruity there that a person who um, commits a category B offense of excessive force would essentially not be, um, a, the, the council wouldn't be able to sanction them until a second offense, um, but somebody who failed to intervene would be sanctionable on their first offense. Well, if um, the only, uh, I probably am wrong here, but the council could take up a dismissal of charge uh, that a local police agency did if they found the process to be ineffective, couldn't that, they? Yes, they could. Uh, how did they get to that point? Um, again, I'm sorry. This is really, <laughs> this is a, an area of law that is not my area of expertise. I'd have to check with Betsy Ann about that. I know okay. that um, the Senate GovOps committee is working um, in particular with this with this subchapter, um, making quite a few changes to it. And I'm, I have not seen the latest of the um, floor amendments coming out on S124, but I believe that they do deal with this section in particular and that's Betsy Ann's bill. So she has more uh, up-to-date information about that. So I'd be happy to reach out to her today and get some more clarity about that and get back to the committee. Okay, thank you. Uh, secondly, this type of situation where you have two people uh, either cooperating or not each other seems to be ripe for what we seem to be seeing more and more, which is filing of a false report. How is that type of action covered in any of these um, situations? Will you repeat the question, filing a false report? Yeah. A a person filing a, a false report, a citizen? An officer, an officer filing a false report. It's like, you know, you, you did something, I saw you do something, gee, you can't say anything about it. Okay, we'll file a false report. Uh, seems to be happening a lot in a lot of the news situations that we find, like the guy that fell down after being pushed by two officers. Um, that's not really addressed. So it'd be a sworn statement, wouldn't it? It would. I I don't see it addressed in the statute either. Um, but again, I can I can check with Betsy Ann about that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Bryn. Um, <laughs> so I think um, I think at this point, if we can start uh, start at the beginning of two nineteen, and. Uh, and go through it sort of line by line and uh, give the committees an opportunity to um, either ask questions or, um, or make suggestions. Uh, you know, I think for instance, we've already decided that the word effectuating should be changed to during um, and other things like that. So if we can start in uh, at the beginning of 219 and see if we can get through the majority of this bill um, in the time that we have remaining. 
Sure. So for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. So um, section one is actually the legislative intent section that appears in that other document. Um, I don't believe you have the bill yet as it is in one form. So 1A is in that draft 2.1 of S219, the instances of amendment from the Senate Judiciary Committee. That's the legislative intent section. Um, and if you recall, section subsection A refers to the, um, the prior work that the legislature has done on issues of systemic racism and disproportionate use of force by law enforcement. Um, and it ends with that statement that um, this act represents one step in the legisl legislature's ongoing effort to combat racial bias and increase accountability in policing. Um, I believe you heard some testimony from the executive director of racial equity that it might make sense to press on that point a little bit more and put in another sentence about um, the General Assembly being committed to this issue and continuing work on it. And this is not the, this bill doesn't represent the end of that work. So I will wait for the committee to let me know if, if you would like more um, in the legislative intent section. Um, um, thank you, Bryn. I, 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 for one, would. Um, yeah, and I, I have some other things as, as well, but thank you. There, go ahead. Yeah, I've got some people with hands up. Mike Merwicki has a question. I just wanted to agree with the, the last thing that Bryn said about adding that sentence to the end as suggested uh, yesterday, I think by Susanna, uh, that this is not the alpha and the omega. This is a part of a process that will continue. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Selena. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I, uh, it's this is not exactly a question, but just as we're looking at that legislative intent section getting fleshed out, and I know Maxine, you've um, been thinking a lot about this, and I'm sure um, others have as well. I mean, it seems to me like we need to go further in this language um, or somewhere in the bill about really we have heard again and again from impacted communities that they're concerned that we're rushing forward and that they want more to have more leadership and guidance on our work on police reform. And I, I just really think we need to make meaningful and serious commitments in this legislation if we are gonna make, move something forward um, that really commits us to a clear, a clear, um, process that we can realize in the coming months and years to make that be the case. Thank you. I can definitely appreciate that. And Maxine and I have talked a lot about what, um, what that would look like and certainly want to welcome uh, members of the committee who are here with us today or anyone who's watching on YouTube um, to reach out if they have thoughts on on the, the process that we should undertake in order to move forward with, um, with some of the many other issues that we have identified through, uh, through yeah. these conversations. So thank you, Selena. Um, Tom Burdett has a question. Um, kind of question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I guess, I think that's, I like the idea around the legislative intent about changing it a little bit. And, um, but I, I guess, you know, and a piece of it would be, you know, that we will continue. Um, and, and to me, when I hear that, it means from, from here forward. And, and I don't know how, what the language would be or even if we end up putting it in, but I, I would certainly like to see something, uh, or if, if we, again, if we can, of what we've done in the past. Um, I've been on judiciary now for six years and we have passed a number of bills uh, um, through the years, and I'm going to say it's probably sliding toward 10 bills through the, in the last six years uh, on racial bias and, and that type of thing, and and trying to do the right thing, um, you know, and, and moving forward on it. Um, I, I believe the first one that we passed uh, was the uh, collecting data, um, you know, the, the the police 
uh, forces collecting data, you know, on um, what was the, the initial bill. And but anyway, I, I would I would just like to see possibly see something about um, the work we've already done. So, and I know it's not enough. Um, and and uh, whatever we do this year, that you know, um, I think it's going to be a, a continuing thing. But um, I, I think it's worth noting. Thanks, Tom. Maxine. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, Tom. And um, and it might be helpful, Bryn, if you could review um, section uh, or subject A of the intent that I. I think might help answer, um, Tom, your, your question and, uh, and make sure that, that everything is covered in here. But I, I believe that was part of the, um, part of the, where the Senate was going to recognize some of that work. And it's, so, so Bryn, could, could you just maybe do a very quick walkthrough of, of, um, a and the various acts that are in here and um, to see if that responds to, uh, yeah. to Representative Burtis. Thanks. Sure, so you can take a look at um, subsection A. It lists, uh, this actually comes from a memo um, that was worked on by Legislative Council uh, about a month ago uh, that summarized the, the work that the legislature has done over the past several years with respect to these issues. Um, it may, several of these bills became um, bigger acts than they started out as. Uh, many, of, many of these are representative of uh, bills that a lot of different bills got tacked onto at the end. So it only, subsection A only describes the bill by its title. It doesn't talk about everything that the bill does. Um, if, if, if you wanted, we could go into some more detail there. It might get very long um, if you wanted to talk about what each one of these bills actually does because several of them, including um, Act 54 from 2017, actually the, the act summary is probably four pages long. It does a whole lot of things. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about that if, if you'd like, but, um, but this is a pretty representative list of, of what the legislature has done since 2013 with respect to racial bias. Great, thank you. Great. So let's uh, let's all take um, take a few moments, maybe while we're listening to announcements on the floor, to do some review of um, of that intent, and know that we will come back with a, a fuller set of intent language um, to look at before we're done with this bill. Um, Martin Lalonde. So yeah, just on the intent, this is fairly narrow. It's something I raised before that I think in subsection A we should strike the. <clears throat> the line about uh, 2016 Act Number 163 regarding body cameras, because you know that's that's a horn we shouldn't toot because nothing really resulted from that except for perhaps a policy that ACLU tore apart as being completely inadequate uh, yesterday. So I would strike that one phrase on that. That seems very logical. All right, so Bryn, okay. back back to the bill. Okay. <clears throat> um, sub, so I'll talk about subsection B here of legislative intent, if you'd like. Uh, this is reflective of um, the Senate's wish to uh, set out the intent of the General Assembly that law enforcement not um, begin with use of force, but begin with de-escalation tactics. And in setting out that intent, um, the first sentence really reflects many of the uh, policies that uh, exist in the 21st century policing report um, without specifically naming that that um, that report. Um, I, I did hear some testimony from some witnesses that it may make sense to to um, reference that report directly. I'm not sure if that's something that the committee wanted to do. Um, Come here. Using my hand. Go ahead, Maxine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I um, I think it. I personally think it would be important to um, to name it, um, as well as the um, certification. I'm forgetting CREA or some of the things that I sent you in that coach also um, suggested as as well. Um, so, thank you. So. Um, 
would it be the intent? So just to get some more clarity here about, about what the committees want to do, would it be the intent of the General Assembly that um, law enforcement adopt these, the, the pillars of 21st century policing or that the legislature may begin, is sort of committing to begin work on requiring law enforcement to adopt those policies? Selena. Too many buttons to press to be able to talk. Um, I, I feel like this is a really good example of where um, those voices that we heard saying nothing with us, nothing about us without us is really important. And I don't feel ready personally to direct the, um, to, to say that just as an individual that my legislative intent is that people will wholesale adopt those pillars because I know there have been some meaningful critiques of those pillars and the, the uh, some of the approaches they represent for really investing heavily in additional tools and resources for policing at some points in time in, in some ways that um, I have some reservations about um, I definitely think like um, so I don't know it wouldn't I think that's a good example of um, I wouldn't want us to rush forward with just a wholesale endorsement of those pillars without meaningful conversation with um, with impacted communities although I think we could point to them I, I just I mean, I guess I'm just speaking personally here, but I would be really wary of saying like, this is this is gonna be our pre approach to police reform moving forward. Maxine. Thank you, so Selena, what about something like um, exploring or consider or just naming naming it uh, yeah. without um, without any commitment? I mean, I think that's, that's what I was thinking. Would that, would that work for you? Yes, I'm, I'm far more comfortable with that. Okay, all right, Bryn, you got that, yeah. Uh, Barbara? Thanks. Um, I actually was gonna suggest something like what Maxine suggested, where we're not committing to a particular methodology, but perhaps we are strongly saying, um, our view about how people are treated and um, the use of force as a um, methodology without talking about community policing. Um, the other piece that just seems really important is, again, making sure people don't feel like we're asking for their recommendations and do something with them. The, the testimony, um, about the, of just like, why are you having us make recommendations? Just, I, I keep hearing that and I don't want this to sort of perpetuate people feeling like we're gonna do what we want, you know? And, and I think Selena was saying that with nothing about us without us. Um, so those two points seem really important to me. Thank you. Um, so committee, we've got about 15 minutes before we need to scoot and, uh, and get to the floor. It was our hope that we would have um, an opportunity to, to get through the bill language in, in order to maybe give Bryn a couple hours to, uh, to do some redrafting and bring us, um, bring us something more to look at at noon. So I'm wondering if we have um, if we can sort of shift gears, knowing that we need to come back to the intent and get both the tone and the content of that right, um, can we can we at least jog through the various sections of the bill and um, and see if people are feeling uh, feeling like they have recommendations to make, kind of in a section by section as opposed to line by line. Would it be helpful if I did a quick yeah. some synopsis of the of the sections? Yes. To prompt people. Okay. Thank you. 
so uh, I'll move to the 3.1 draft of S219. So the first two sections um, are making state grant funding of law enforcement agencies contingent on the approval of the Secretary of Administration, um, ensuring that that law enforcement agency has complied with race data reporting requirements. And section two is uh, refers to that first section, requires the Secretary to notify all uh, law enforcement agencies about that new contingency that's effective on January 1st. All right, John Gannon. I believe we heard testimony that not many local law enforcement receive grants. So I'm not sure how much of a stick um, this is. Um, and we may want to consider something besides just grants as a stick. Um, However, I will say we have not received any testimony about compliance with the collection of data. So I don't know how large of a problem this is. Um, I th think that we have heard testimony that, uh, that it's a bit of a patchwork. And, um, and so while the stick might not be uh, as effective, um, you know, at least it, it does it does drive a finer point to it. And, and we do probably need to come back to the data collection um, uh, with some refinements to what we expect to be collected. Right. Well, another potential stick that every law, local law enforcement agency needs is um, to get training to get a level three law enforcement officers. Um, so that might be a stick that would impact every single um, local law enforcement department around the state. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Um, good morning, Madam Chair. Um, in this particular section, I think I'd rather, rather than use a stick, talk about the carrot here. And that we did hear testimony that there is wide disparities between this collection of data um, and, and it's almost like a chicken or the egg you've got to have the process in place you have to have the training in place in order to do this correctly and a lot of communities are out there maybe can't afford to make this investment initially up front um, I would prefer to see that we would get the resources available make sure that law enforcement is availing themselves of that resource and then hold them accountable to use it and use it correctly and make sure that we have the consistency and continuity that we need so that this data does what we want it to do. Yeah, makes sense. All right, shall we keep jogging through the sections? Oh, Ken has a hand up, go ahead, Ken. You're going to want to unmute. I'm not sure we've heard a lot of testimony. I'm not sure we need to or want to run uh, rush through this. I think we've heard a lot of testimony uh, that a lot of changes are already being done by law enforcement. I have certain big concerns about local municipalities being able to do this and doing this right. And also, uh, like what was brought up, I'm not sure you could get proper training. I think there's only so many uh, law enforcement that you can run through at a certain time to get done. I'm, I'm not sure you're going to be close to meeting those requirements. That's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. So let's see if we can keep jogging through the bill. Any? Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. So section three is that uh, race data reporting requirement adds the um, expands the required data that um, law enforcement is required to collect to use of force data. Um, and I understand that we're going to strike effectuating and use the word during instead. On bottom of bottom of page two there. Okay. Um, page three, this is the requirement that uh, law enforcement work with the executive director of racial equity um, and the council and the vendor chosen by the council in, um, in how it collects data and organizes it. 
subdivision three requires that the executive director is tasked with receiving that data in addition to the vendor chosen by the council. Page four um, requires that the agency receiving the data reports it annually to the general assembly. And then it puts some parameters on what physical force means. I don't think that there were any um, changes that were raised with respect to this section, but. Um, Marcia Gardner has a question. So in section three, uh, I've made some notes that people had talked about should uh, the reason for the search be included in the data, prob probable cause, why the search? Yeah. Yeah, I, I had um, I had other thoughts. Um, we talked about the reason and grounds for the stop and search, possibly. That's kind of my flashpoint. It seems like a significant point to potential escalation. And even though the commissioner says that the data might not be easy to encode, uh, that does not mean that if it's not I mean, if it's not collected, it's not available. Um, the scenario is ACLU or somebody sends a student intern out to compile it, then it's available to be done. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. And I think it's a significant issue. And sorry. also, um, uh, User friendly, we wanted to um, change that to, uh, I think Hal suggested understandable. And I know Will had some, I know Will, if you had any thoughts, but you had, you had raised that initially. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, and I agree that understandable uh, would, would work. I mean, my concern was user friendly with such a uh, loose definition. And I know from um, events that, that I've attended, we've taken place, I know the uh, Racial Justice Alliance, for example, had a demonstration where they showed just how difficult it was to sort through the data as it's currently being presented. So um, user-friendly, you know, was uh, questionable to me because user-friendly to who? Um, understandable, I, I think, is, is still on the vague side, but I think it's a preferential word to what's in there now. Thanks. Great. Uh, John Gannon. So going back to the beginning of section three, um, this is, I think we heard testimony about the, that there was some concerns about just limiting this to roadside stops. Um, should this be expanded beyond roadside stops? Um, because, you know, there are other police stops beyond just pulling over cars. So we are missing a huge chunk of data. Maxine. Yeah, thank you. I, I heard that too. I, I'm not sure if if we can, if we can do that right um, here in the bill, but perhaps um, in the intent section, it might be, might be something that that we could list as things to um, to explore. Just consideration. Um, My list is growing of things that we <laughs> that we have intent to come back to. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I think I think that's testimony that we heard very clearly. Um, Tom has his hand up. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, going back to the stop and search uh, that Maxine was talking about a couple minutes ago um, and, and collecting more, more data. I have no, no issue at all with collecting more data. I mean, at, at some point, um, and, and I don't know if we're there, you know, maybe it, be, it becomes cumbersome and, and, and difficult to do, but um, I, I think we're sadly lacking um, you know, some of the things we've discussed, but with, with, uh, would it be separate, uh, uh, Maxine, the way that you had, the way that I heard it, maybe not the way you worded it, um, you, you said, uh, data for stop and search. Now, would it, uh, would it be, uh, would they be separate because, uh, the stop, uh, is one thing and if the if something comes up is seen is said and then the search would uh, potentially happen um, so with that uh, I, I guess somehow that would need to be a different column I guess you could say as far as collecting the, the data goes 
Right, I think what I was saying, um, I talked about grounds for this stop. Right now it says reason. So um, so just somehow bringing in search and, and, and instead of using reason, using grounds, it's, is what I thought I heard in, in, um, in the testimony. So, okay. Um, I don't know if that's, that's clear, but just. Right, yeah, yeah, just the way that I heard it, it, it was stop and search. And that makes it sound like it's, it's, uh, um, it, it's one thing, yeah. one yeah. planned thing. And, and right. I just want to make sure that it's, that they're somehow separate. Right, um, thank you. No, that's it may only be a stop. Um, I, right, no, I appreciate that, yeah, thank you, thanks. <clears throat> Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. A couple things. I, I have to find myself in agreement with the representative from Burlington, Mr. Hooper, as far as that if, you know, if there is a search conducted during a stop, that there should be some reason why that search had to happen. And then to uh, address uh, the representative from Rutland's concern about searching the data, um, who's the target audience that we're looking to have this data be searchable by? If it's the general public, then it would seem to me that we would want to state that and have it in a form and a way that the general public could search it and that it would be accessible to them. And I know user friendly isn't the word that we're looking to use, but that it was searchable by the general public so that, again, they could extrapolate the data from that that we're looking for. Uh, I think Will has his hand up to answer that thought. Yes, thank you. You know, that's that's a very good point. Um, I had actually written down after I finished uh, speaking was thinking about it more, um, understand about changing language to something like understandable by a lay person or something to that degree that isn't is awkward. Because I do think, you know, what we want is for, you know, community action groups to be able to look at this data and have a clear understanding and be able to clearly compare law enforcement agencies throughout the state and, and how they're handling this issue. So yeah, I, I do think that if the language could be tweaked to make it clear we are talking about not law enforcement professionals, but the data is clear and understandable to citizens at large, um, that would be ideal. Thank you. Great, uh, Barbara. Thanks. So one thing is, I'm wondering if on the data question, if asking, I don't know if we've heard from Stephanie or any of the CRG folks have had thoughts about the questions that should be asked. It definitely seems like it's important that it be open to the public. And on stops, I just wanted to say some of the most troubling cases in Burlington were not about traffic stops. They were about um, people on either on the street or leaving the hospital or um, so I really think we've got to look at bigger than just traffic stops. We're going to get a skewed view of when it's happening. Yeah, let's all collectively flag that because um, I think there's much more work we need to do with respect to the uh, to the data part of this. Um, Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Barbara just basically took the words right out of my mouth, except for saying stop and frisk. Um, it's it's a, a big thing that we need to keep an eye on. Yeah. Uh, Selena. Uh, I agree with everyone who's saying that we need to go beyond traffic stop data. I think you know, these provisions of this bill are focused on compliance with traffic stop data because we actually require it to be collected and reported. And that's that's not true for a lot of other kinds of data. So I agree that that's an important um, larger conversation to have. I was just gonna say uh, on the question of the user-friendly um, and finding the right language there, there's uh, quite a quite a bit of provisions we've passed in recent years on kind of economic um, bills coming out of our commerce committee where we've included those kinds of provisions like around contract language um, uh, and there may there just may maybe there's some language there in other parts of statute we can pull on without having to <clears throat> reinvent the wheel around just um, readability and understandability to 
like people who aren't professional law enforcement folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that something that you could could check with um, Commerce Council? Please. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, how? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say in response to what Barbara shared, it's called Walking While Black and Brown. And I have too many stories that express that phenomenon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, uh, Marsha. We had one witness who suggested that the data should be searchable by county, town, and officer. Do we know if that data is included currently? Good question. I don't see anybody raising their hand to answer that question. Uh, John Gannon, <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> I, know, I know it's searchable by town because I've looked at my own town's um, stop data. Um, I do not know if it's searchable by officer. I don't believe that it is searchable by officer. Okay, so that's another uh, another data detail that we want to explore for the future. Uh, anything else on the data collection sections? So we're we're going to make a few a few changes to clarify, but also recognizing that there's much finer grained work that needs to be done here. Um, so um, I think that uh, I think that the floor is convening right now, and I think that Martin and Kelly both have a bill that's up for third reading, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, yeah, actually. So, so, um, um, excuse me, this um, speaker is going to do 2.32 early and um, would like Kelly in backup. So Martin, if you could, if you could be her backup and then, um, and then come back and then it looks like we can, we can, we all have um, leave of the floor um, until 10.30. And so as we get closer to 10.30, I can check in with the speaker again, um, assuming Bryn, you're okay to, to be with us past 10. All right. Um, so great, Kelly and Martin, come back um, as soon as you are able. Um, and all right, so we have we have uh, made note that we want to come back to this data section in much more detail um, at a future date. Uh, any other questions on section three of the bill? All right, so Bryn, let's keep moving forward. Okay, so section four deals I'm with the- sorry, I just noticed a hand up. Marsha, go ahead. Um, I made a note that uh, physical force might need a better definition. That's in sub five. Oh, right. Somebody was saying that it should be any force used that's beyond compliant handcuffing. That's what I have for notes. Are other folks remembering that? Yeah, that was the commissioner and that's what I, he uses I, the phrase. Right, right. Uh, Tom? Yeah, uh, what you just said, Sarah, I don't know, I don't, I guess I don't understand what, what you said um, as far as the definite, the meaning of what it. So the notes that I have um, <coughs> say that that um, any force beyond compliant handcuffing uh, ought to be ought, ought to be what we're referring to here. Um, it is as opposed to, I guess, um, listing a bunch of different uh, techniques. Right. So, so uh, if somebody is compliant and, and they they let. You know they they let themselves be handcuffed. Um, so what this will say is that you can't use force after that. Um, if the is that what we're leaning toward. Well, I think I I think this the sense that I got when we were taking this testimony was if it's compliant handcuffing, then it is not force. 
and it and if it's uh, and if it's non-compliant, um, then that then that should be in the category of a use of force. And maybe Maxine remembers better, but Marsha, Marsha must be talking about the same uh, the same testimony that I'm recalling. I think it did come from Commissioner Sherling. So Some language that he was looking for, you mean? He, he said that the physical force needed a better definition. Okay. That's right. Um, so I was wondering if we could go back to, to Bryn. Uh, I, so first of all, sorry, I'm, I'm helping Kelly at the same time. Uh, <laughs> so I, um, so we're, we're talking about seven, is that correct? Or, or somewhere else? I want to make sure I'm in the right place. I think like, we're on page four, subdivision yeah. five. Okay, so um, okay, right. Um, I, I can tell the committee where this language came from, if that's thank helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So this came from Mark Anderson, who I believe is the sheriff. Um, and he gave some testimony to the Senate Judiciary Committee that there were um, four or five different categories of force and the sort of lowest level being compliance controls, which would include compliant handcuffing. And um, it, that category would also include just presence of the officer because law enforcement is trained that their very presence is a use of force. Um, and so anything, so this list is intended to cover anything beyond compliance control. So the next level would be um, contact controls. That's when a, an officer actually uses, puts their hands on a person to, to direct their compliance. Um, so there are uh, sort of definitions of these phrases that uh, law enforcement uses in training. So it may be helpful if, um, if, if, these are sort of defined here. The, the committee may want to see what each of these categories actually uh, encompasses. And I can do that in the next draft. <clears throat> um, so we do have Commissioner Sherling with us. Um, and uh, so I guess I'm going to invite him to, uh, to, to clarify maybe what he was talking about before. Yeah, I'd like to know a little bit more about compliant handcuffing. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think I can make this brief. Uh, the reason that we're suggesting removing the technical language and just going to uh, language that says um, force beyond compliant handcuffing is because that would capture everything that involves some level of force beyond presence or compliant handcuffing. And those definitions uh, and the frameworks we use are an area that constantly evolves. So if you memorialize the specific phrases in statute, every time there's an evolution in uh, training and the way we describe things, which happens quite frequently, um, then the statute will have to be updated versus just saying everything beyond compliant handcuffing, which will capture everything. Compliant handcuffing is a phrase that hasn't changed in uh, a couple of decades at least. Um, it just simplifies and creates a very broad um, array of things that uh, that need to be reported. So it's it's just a more simplistic and, and longer lasting way to phrase it. Rob, does that help? Um, I, I, not really. I guess maybe it's because I've never had the opportunity to be compliantly handcuffed. Um, but it seems to me that everything up to that would be okay. But when we're talking about handcuffing somebody, aren't we putting hands on them? And isn't that, I don't know, the officer exerting authority really formally then? Uh, well, you can count compliant handcuffing uh, by simply counting the number of arrests where people were not just issued a citation. So in term, this is around data collection. So if you're looking to count that, it's easy to count using something else. What we're trying to count is when force is used and um, handcuffs are not considered 
I mean, they fall in this in the force continuum, but it's when it's done in a compliant fashion, it's not something that we weave into our use of force reports because then you'd be doing a use of force report on every single arrest. Okay, I'm going to have to digest that just a little bit, so I won't yeah. hold things up. Thank you. We're uh, flagging this as a question mark. Um, Tom Burdett. Yeah, thank you. Um, Commissioner, I, I'm still a little confused around the compliant thing. So a, a, a person being compliant isn't necessarily, I, I'm guessing at this point, uh, letting you handcuff them or they are? No, they are. Uh, compliant handcuffing okay. is the overwhelming majority of physical arrests that happen. And you say to somebody, listen, uh, need to place you under arrest. We've got to go back to the station for some processing. Uh, please put your hands behind you. I'm going to put handcuffs on you. That's the way it happens in the overwhelming majority of, of cases. If you go back to my earlier testimony, uh, the state police do about 118,000 uh, respond to 118,000 events a year. Um, force beyond compliant handcuffing was used in 223 of those 117,000 events. Okay, yeah, I, I think I would like to see this uh, simplified because the way I read this uh, myself is that there uh, could actually be some um, some force used in, in compliant handcuffing, but that's that's just me, the way I understand the, the language as it's written. What, maybe if it helps, Madam Chair, what I'm suggesting is a more broad, the language I'm suggesting is more broad than what you've written and will not get stale over time. I can appreciate that. Um, Barbara Rachelson. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So I was looking at the campaign zero model plan um, or model policy and they say, which I really liked, um, officers shall not um, use up a, a, a level of force higher than the level of threat. Um, so I'm just wondering if, because handcuffing does seem like it's in that physical category and um, Earlier in it, they just say officers shall strive to use the minimum amount of force necessary to accomplish a lawful purpose, including levels of force lower than the level of threat. So I just wonder, I like the commissioner's idea about simplifying it. I just think handcuffing might be the wrong spot. Um, Nader Hashim. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to jump in on this conversation and the, the, the commissioner was able to basically settle the majority of what I was thinking. Uh, I mean, compliant handcuffing is in a way when the other person essentially consents to being detained without resisting. You know, you, you tell the person, turn around and put your hands behind your back because you're under arrest and the other person will say, okay, I guess I'm coming with you. And then you move on from there when it escalates is when the person says, no, I'm not going with you and you're gonna have to fight me if you want me to go. That's when real force starts being used. So I, I think it would, be, um, it would be peculiar to have a use of force report for every single compliant handcuffing um, instance. Yeah, I, I think one thing that is important is making sure that handcuffs are um, checked for tightness and double locked because I know that there have been instances across the country where you know uh, cops have intentionally tightened handcuffs to the point where they would restrict blood flow to the hands and people actually um, suffered nerve damage to their hands. So I, I think that's one small piece that should be um, looked at but having a use of force report done for every compliant handcuffing case um, would would be a little strange and uh, yeah that, I wanted to share that thank you Rob LeClaire I guess the thing that I'm struggling with is if, if I'm being compliant why do I have to be handcuffed <laughs> it it just doesn't seem to make sense to me 
if I'm well, not being compliant or the officer has a reason to be concerned about me or my behavior, then I guess I get it. But it just seems like it's kind of an oxymoron here. It's a policy. Policy sounds, sounds about right. I mean, if, you know, it's, there's rule three to consider, which is that, you know, if you know, there, there are certain crimes where a person can be, where a person is either arrested or they are issued a citation. And also there are times where you don't know if a person is going to change their behavior after being detained. You know, sometimes people will become compliant. They'll say, yeah, sure, that's fine. I messed up and I'll come with you uh, willingly. And then five minutes later, it starts to dawn on them that they're in big trouble and then their attitude starts to change. Um, and also for the sake of performing um, searches uh, concurrent with arresting someone, because when you arrest somebody for a crime, you um, search them incident to that. And so it, you know, there's also the officer safety element that's involved as well. Okay, thank you. Question. I hope I hope it does. Thank you. Any other questions, comments on this section? All right, Bryn, do you have what you need on that a recommendation of language to use? So are you wanting to go with the commissioner's suggestion about anything beyond compliant handcuffing? Because I did have one other suggestion, which is um, the way that the House GovOps Committee amended this definition in your work um, on 464. Um, the way you changed it was as using the subsection physical force shall refer to the force employed by a law enforcement officer to compel a person's compliance with the officer's instructions period and you didn't leave and you didn't have any um, specific language after that so i wonder if you wanted to um, leave it that broad and in your intent section um, put in some language about studying what use of force uh, data should actually be collected that's one other option. I am open to input from, uh, from either committee on that question. Could you say that one more time, Bren? Just um, so the way that the House GovOps Committee did some work on uh, this language in a House bill was to end the the. Um, definition of physical force after the officer instructions on line five. So just referred to force employed by law enforcement in compelling a person's compliance with their instructions. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm, I just was not sensing from the committee if you were all coalescing around um, the commissioner's recommendation about any force beyond compliant handcuffing or if there was still some concern about that. So that was a one recommended, uh, or one suggested way to handle this. And then putting some more language in the intent section about specifically looking at use of force data and what that physical force should encompass. I like that, I like that approach. I'll just say as one person. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jim Harrison. Yeah. I. Doug, I guess I don't, it's been so while, oh, such a while, I don't remember the 464 conversation because I think that bill's still in our committee, right? Um, um, I kind of like what the commissioner suggested, but I don't know the legal uh, differences between those two approaches. Yep, uh, we will get to him in just a moment. Hal? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what I would like to see is following the commissioner's recommendation because for me it creates the border between force and excessive force so if you're non-compliant then it escalates in terms of the force issue so that's how i see it and i like the commissioner's recommendation commissioner shirling i think uh representative colston um said it in a uh in a way that may be uh, more understandable than than how i described it uh 
Uh, I would caution against the language that was in 464 if I understood it correctly and I don't have it in front of me because in operationalizing that it would create confusion. Um, I think we would end up essentially writing, uh, collecting statistics on every time an officer was present because uh, as someone else testified to, the presence of officers is a technical use uh, of force. Um, harken back to the this constitutional overlay, the presence of a police officer under certain circumstances can constitute a seizure in and of itself. So again, that line of demarcation that Representative Colston articulated is, you know, when compliance is lost and now some level of force beyond presence is exerted is really what we are striving to measure here. That makes sense. Thank you. So Bryn, let's go back to you. Okay, so we'll change that to provide uh, any force that's used something along the lines of beyond uh, compliant handcuffing. Thank you. Okay, so I'll move on to the next, uh, <clears throat> the next section, section four. So the, this is the unprofessional conduct subchapter and, and uh, chapter 151 on the Criminal Justice Training Council. And uh, the changes here add the two additional types of category B professional misconduct, which are placing a person in a prohibited restraint or failing to intervene. And one thing I wanted to point out that I don't think I spoke about earlier is on page six, subdivision C, um, there's a change made here that it was also made in S-124 that provides that excessive use of force first offense would be um, subject to sanctioning by the council. Um, so I believe that um, there was a question earlier about whether or not there was an incongruity between um, an officer being sanctioned by the council for failing to intervene on a first offense. Um, and I just wanted to point out that under this language, a person who uses an officer who uses excessive force would be sanctionable under a first offense. That is not current law, but that is what is, that's what. Um, Nader has a, his hand up. Thank you. I just wanted to mention that I think, and if Bryn or anyone else um, has any suggestions here, that would be great. But I think we need to define what intervention looks like. You know, is it stopping an excessive use of force at that exact moment? Or is it reporting to a supervisor after the fact? Or is it both of those things? Um, I, I think that's a really important um, necessity right there. I was wondering if there might be any language suggestions for that possibly. Uh, Tom Burdett just jumped in. Yeah, I don't have any language <laughs> suggestions at this point, but um, just kind of a question. In a situation where there's a potential uh, intervention, uh, you know, from a, uh, you know, if somebody's being restrained, I mean, I look at police forces as being kind of quasi-military and, and having a, a pecking order. And uh, how easy is it or for a um, somebody with a lower rank to be intervening um, on somebody with a higher rank? Um, you know, if they intervene and, and it's deemed, the, say, the person doing the restraint wasn't doing anything wrong, what would happen to the person that intervened? Um, would they be reprimanded, uh, you know, at, at that point? So it's just something that goes through my mind with the, when, when, I guess, when there's a pecking order. I, I agree with that, Tom. There is, I mean, you, you know, when, if, if you're a brand new cop and you're working with your sergeant, you know, generally everything that sergeant says is it's quasi-military as you said and you know that newer cop is you know i if they see that sergeant using excessive force 
what will probably go through their head is, well, the sergeant's doing it, so it this must be the right thing. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I agree and see where you're coming from, Tom. And the next thing is, you know, how do we, how do we work around it? You know? Yeah. Any thoughts folks? All right. Well, let's flag that and, um, come back to it. Okay. So the next language at the bottom of page six is the definition of prohibited restraints. Not sure if there, if you were satisfied with that definition. Does anybody have notes or concerns on that? Nope. Okay, so I'll move on to 2407, this is the limitation on council's ability to sanction. Um, and this carves out those two new category B misconducts from uh, the limitation on the council's ability to sanction officers so they can be sanctioned for a first offense for those two new um, categories of conduct. Uh, Maxine. Thank you. I uh, I heard testimony that the on line six that the may uh, should be changed to shall. Um, you know what? Just wanted to remind folks of that. I agree. I would agree with that. Okay. And then um and then also I know that Martin had some questions uh, that this was too limited, uh, but then I also have notes that the Sentencing Commission is or will be addressing this and that also uh, that the um, Senate is addressing this and Bryn, maybe you could help us. I don't know if that's part of S-124. It is, I, um, it is. As a part of 124, I haven't seen the latest. Um, I know that there have been some floor amendments that are being worked on, so I'm just not sure what the latest iteration is. So, Bryn, when you say floor amendments, um, did it look at the may versus shall or expanding the, the breadth? Or? Yes, both of those things I believe are being looked at, but I'm, I, I just don't know what is, uh, I don't know what's happening because it's happening as we speak. Maxine, where, where exactly is that may versus shall? On uh, page seven, line six. Line, okay, that's what I thought it was. Great, thank you. Well, maybe, uh, so Bryn, they, uh, if they are working on it as we, as we speak, um, Sarah, I wonder if we should maybe, you know, kind of flag this bookmark it, see if we can get um, indication of what the, Senate is doing? Yep. Okay. So shall I move on for now to section five, the new crime then? Yes. Okay, so um, section five is the crime of law enforcement use of prohibited restraints. It makes it a crime for a law enforcement officer acting in their capacity in law, uh, as law enforcement um, to use a prohibited restraint that causes serious bodily injury or death. Makes it a 20 year felony, $50,000 fine. <clears throat> now you've heard quite a bit of testimony about this section, so I wasn't sure where the committee was, was, uh, was going with this. Happy to answer any questions. Yes, uh, John Gannon. So, so Bryn, I mean, we've heard several people testify that this is basically already a crime. Would you concur with that that testimony? Yeah, this is um, an action that could be charged absolutely under aggravated assault. Um, I would point out that this 
and as other people have, have pointed out, this is um, essentially a strict liability crime. There is not an intent element, meaning a law enforcement officer who put a person in a prohibited restraint under these circumstances, and that restraint caused serious bodily injury or death to another person would be culpable regardless of uh, the officer's intent or mental state when committing that act. So um, in that sense, it is different from aggravated assault. Hmm. It doesn't mean that a person couldn't be charged under the aggravated assault statute for that exact conduct, but um, the, the elements that the prosecutor would be required to prove are different. That's an important distinction, thank you. Um, Tom Burdett. Yeah, I'm not real crazy about this section, but, um, you know, I mean, I've heard some stories, you know, uh, around this, you know, actual, you know, stories in the field, but, and I'm, I'm just wondering if, uh, if Chief Fakos is still going to be testifying, um, and, and if he is, I would certainly like to hear the, the story that he told in the Senate. Um, you know, reg regarding rest restraints in a situation that he had um, where, um, yes, the, the, I mean, the, that's, that's the max restraint as far as being physical goes, but um, sometimes max, um, a max restraint needs to be uh, used to dealing with a, uh, um, in, in a situation. But anyway, I, I didn't know if he was still going to be testifying because it, it uh, zeroes right in on this. Yeah, it does. Um, so the um, the chief is not available to, to be with us today. Um, certainly wasn't at nine o'clock and I believe that the email I saw said that he wasn't available at noon either. Um, there is testimony in Senate Judiciary that we could um, sh certainly share a link around on, um, but, but um, Maxine, you had some thoughts on this. Right, I guess, I guess I'm of two minds. I, I, I think it's important to have a separate crime. Uh, I also think it's important to get it right. And uh, um, hearing that the state's attorneys may have some suggestions. Uh, so one possibility would be to take it out, but make it very, very clear in the intent that we are going to continue to work on it. Um, unless we were able to get, for instance, the language from the state's attorneys, you know, in the next few hours or before, you know, um, but uh, so, so if, if, if enough folks feel like they don't want it in here, I could live with that, but with very clear intent that we do need to, um, to look into creating another crime, uh, recognizing uh, that, that it's not already covered. And that it's so, yeah, in, in the interest of time, is there a consensus that we, um, that we take this out for now and put it into the parking lot of issues that we need to come back to? Can I just ask a really quick question of, of Bren? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think that might help me discern my own answer to that question. And I'm sorry, I keep taking my jacket off. It's just really hot where I am. Um, Bryn, is the I I cannot recall off the top of my head what the penalty for aggravated assault is. How do the penalties track between the way someone could be charged under existing law and the, what's proposed here? Um, if I remember correctly, aggravated assault is a maximum fifteen year felony. Okay, so this is a this is a twenty year maximum. Okay. Okay. Um, Tom? That must have been up from before, sorry. Okay. Uh, Jim Harrison? Yeah, I, I concur with what Maxine just said. I, uh, when Bryn said strict liability, it kind of gave it a new light. Um, and I, I think there may be cases where uh, the officer was justified and I don't know all the nuances. So I, that's why I was trying to press um, the state's attorneys to, you know, come back with something if we needed to, 
fix it here or if we need to come back to it later. So I just, I'm not comfortable with it as worded here and I'd like to see it modified a little bit. Thank you. Okay, Barbara. Uh, so, so I think if we took it out, I have some discomfort and I think it all depends on how strongly it's stated in the intent section. But I'm leaning towards it, voting for it to stay in it in some modified form. Okay. So um, if I may, Sarah, to respond to Barbara. So, um, so Barbara, if you could be thinking if it were to come out, um, if you could help with intent language, to, you know, to make okay. sure that um, if, if you're comfortable with that, but also if you feel like you just need to vote no. <laughs> right. No, <laughs> my, I, you know. I think that intent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Selena. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what Barbara said and would be happy Barbara to, um, work with you on intent language around that. If you want to help her, I just want to, I feel awesome. like I'm on the record that, uh, I am totally fine with leaving this in the bill, but I, if the, um, majority of the group feels it needs to come out, it wouldn't like, that wouldn't prevent me from, um, supporting passage of the provisions of this bill that have more clear and unilateral support behind them. Thank you. Uh, Tom? I did have my hand up that time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I agree with taking it out. I mean, this is, this is the most important part of this bill. Um, it, it is certainly the one uh, generating the most interest and I don't think we need to have any, uh, any questions that we may be rushing on this. Um, it, it, and it is, it, to me, it is the most important part of the bill. This is, this is uh, in a lot of instances, uh, life and death. And, um, and we don't need to be fooling with that. We need to do it and do it right. And, and it's not just life and death for, uh, you know, the, uh, the person that's being um, detained or, or, or restrained. It's, it's life and death for um, our, uh, our police officers also. And um, so I, I am in full uh, support of, of pulling this out and, you know, and doing the work in doing the work on it that needs to be done and taking the time that needs to be taken. Uh, it just needs to be right. All right, uh, Will. Thank you. I certainly agree with my colleague from West Rutland that this is life or death, um, but I would be uh, very hesitant. In fact, I'm all right against the idea of removing this from the bill. Um, it is life or death. And as we've seen repeatedly, if not in Vermont nationwide, um, there are many situations where it is not life or death for the law enforcement officer, but it causes the death of the person they are interacting with. Um, I think removing this uh, waters this bill down. That includes if we add something to, to the intent. Um, I understand we've got to do this. We've, we've got to do it right. But I think there are a lot of people looking to the legislature to properly address this. And um, removing this is not addressing it. It's just kicking the can down the road. And I think a lot of people are frustrated that that is what we continue to do. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Uh, I agree with Will at all. I, I, I think a decision point here is whether we're creating a new crime. I mean, we have a, already established there's a different process for uh, the level to get to conviction and there's a different penalty phase. And the question in my mind is whether you are holding these people who are charged with enforcing the law to a higher level of compliance with the law. So this may there very well be assault by a police officer. You may be creating a new crime. And I don't know that that's not appropriate. I uh, don't know that intent language carries as much weight as I'd like to see in the expectation field. Thank you. Martin. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I understand where Will and, and other folks are coming from, but I, I really think that this isn't ready for prime time as well. And, and I'll give a, a separate reason than what we've heard is there really is um, conflict between what we're doing with this and with uh, 
Title 13, Section 2305, uh, justifiable homicide, uh, which essentially excuses, well, provides pretty broad justification for law enforcement's use of force. Uh, and that's something that I know that the, the Senate was, uh, took a long time looking at that and essentially said, well, we'll, we'll take the chance that what we're doing here might actually uh, repeal this other provision that I just mentioned, uh, but we'll try to work on it in the interim and, and sort that out. I'd rather have that sorted out uh, before we put this new crime out there. Uh, I, I think these two things need to be worked out together. I also want to hear uh, what uh, the state's attorneys come through with. Uh, I, I'm very committed to continuing to work on this, but I really don't think it's ready at this point. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Maxine. Are you able to give us an update in terms of justifiable homicide? Is that an August um, completion or is that a next session? Um, I, I am not sure. Actually, my understanding was that they were going to, the Senate Judiciary was going, Committee was going to take it up today, but um, that's, that is not on their agenda for today. So I haven't, I haven't, I probably haven't heard the latest. So I'm sorry, I can't update you on that. So folks, let's see if we can um, take a look at the subgroups uh, who, who offered to work on intent language around this, um, because I, I take Martin's um, observations and critiques um, very, uh, very carefully that we shouldn't move forward with something that, uh, that may have unintended um, consequences. Um, Barbara Rachelson. Uh, okay, so I'm wondering if, if it would work as a compromise to have the crime stay in there and the intent section talk about the work that needs to be done and will be happening related to the repeal of the older law. And I don't know if that's a question for Martin or the group. I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. Maxine. Yeah. Anybody want to jump in with a thought? I'll, I'll, be, I'll jump in. I think this, I mean, this is a, this is a process issue uh, for, for me. And, and I think that we're not, by putting it out there, uh, and yes, it's important. I absolutely think this is important. I am comforted by the fact that, that uh, these uh, chokeholds are, are already effectively banned uh, by law enforcement and that there's another way that, uh, uh, somebody using one of these that results in death or seriously body, bodily injury uh, will be held accountable. Uh, I still think we should have this, but, but I think we really need to do the right process. Uh, and, and I think we haven't had sufficient consideration uh, of this particular crime. So I think we intend to proceed with it rather than throwing it out there. Um, and and making the existing crime, um, I'm forgetting the word that we call it because, but um, of saying if this occur, if it's committed by a police officer, there's a factor that an enhanced penalty. That may be something we want to look at, but it's just not something that's ready to put a crime in right now that, that it carries a 20 year sentence. Um, I just don't think it's right for prime time. Uh, Rep Seymour. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm just going to agree with some of the other members. I think that pulling that section for now might be the, uh, the best thing to do, but that's all. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sherling has a hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would also point out there's a critical missing element from this draft, uh, among a variety of other problems I think that uh, this section has. Um, it does not have any carve out for instances where lethal force would be justified. Uh, so you could potentially be looking at prosecuting a police officer with penalties well beyond 
what the current aggravated assault statute is in a case where it was a war a, a justifiable uh, use of force um, where their firearm could have been used but they were unable to get to it and had to have someone in one of these unfortunate restraints these are incredibly rare circumstances I'm, I, I don't want anyone to, to think that you know that's something that has the uh, is likely to happen in the next week or month or even year, but it's not something we can take off the table given the nature of, of uh, policing operations. Uh, I, it's really important to keep in mind that we're trying to solve problems with a cross section of operations that is not reflective of the totality of the over 1500 events that law enforcement's responding to on a daily basis in Vermont. So to it's just I, i'll stop talking at this point but a lot more thought has to go into this before it is ready for prime time in my opinion uh, mom heard it oh yeah Bryn, um is Bryn, Bryn, go, go ahead to that i was just going to point out that um the justifiable homicide statute still stands and um any defense that could be raised under the justifiable homicide statute could still be raised. And it's true of common law self-defense defenses as well. I think I mentioned that earlier. Just wanted to point that out for the committees. Thank you. Tom? Yeah, a, a question, I guess, for the commissioner or maybe uh, anyone else. So say the situation, uh, you know, you're in a wrestling, you know, basically a wrestling match with somebody for whatever reason, uh, taser is in, uh, uh, accessible firearm is not accessible. Um, and, and say you've got a, a, a 270 pound, uh, um, man and a 160 pound, uh, officer that's wrestling him. And so at that point, <clears throat> um, there's no way that the officer is going to be able to out wrestle this guy just because of sheer size and, and, uh, and these restraints are illegal. And, uh, so I mean, you're on the ground, he's on top of you, uh, you know, and, and is potentially, uh, you know, uh, going to kill you, you know, kill the officer. So, uh, the officer looks to his right and there's a, about a, a, a six inch boulder there. And so it, if we're making this illegal, you know, the restraint illegal, would, would you consider it to be legal to take that, to take that rock and, and hit, the, uh, hit the subject in the head to protect yourself? And potentially killing him with the rock, would, would, if, if we make the restraint illegal, would, would that be legal to protect yourself? It would, Representative Berta, in, in a case where, uh, death or serious bodily injury is a possibility, whether it's the officer or, or another person. Um, the use of, um, that's the use of lethal force, which is where you're not, tr it's not an intent to kill someone. It's not a, I, I can't remember which committee I testified to. That right. It's, you know, what you see on TV, it's not a shoot to kill scenario. It's a, you're, you're taking whatever action is possible to include rocks, flashlights, um, chairs, you pick a thing, uh, cars, um, whatever action is necessary to stop the action of the subject that poses that imminent risk of death or serious bodily injury. And, and the way that I would see it is, uh, I mean, if you did smack somebody in the head with a rock like that, to me, the, the chances of, of, uh, uh, of killing them or, or maiming them or, you know, uh, traumatic brain injury uh, is going to be a, a higher, uh, um, more of a chance to do more damage than, than a restraint would be. But it, but it would be totally acceptable. Um, and I guess you could say legal to do that. Uh, and and that, that just makes no sense at all to me. Uh, you know, when a restraint in, in those situations um, would be the, the less, uh, lack of a better term, the less violent way of, of uh, getting somebody under control. Uh, I concur. And, you know, I want to reiterate that we are on the road to reform that we need to be on, but we cannot completely discount the fact that we live in a world that unfortunately has violence and has people that do not have regard for human life 
Uh, and there is only one line of defense for those folks, and that is the roughly million police officers in the United States. And you cannot completely neuter their ability to function. Thank you. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I would have to agree with uh, the member from Rutland here that if, uh, if an officer needs to use deadly force, and I'm sure that they're training, they would hopefully recognize that, that we shouldn't be taking any means away from them that they need to use to address that issue. Um, it just, it seems to me that, like the commissioner said, that we would be neutering them. And I'm not sure that's the intent here. Thank you. Okay, so we, this, is a, this is a section of the bill that's giving us a lot to think about, a lot to talk about. Um, so I'm gonna suggest that we uh, hold on to that for a moment. It, we're very close to getting through the end of the bill um, and, uh, and we can certainly come back and decide uh, once and for all what to do with this section of the bill. But let's take a peek at the last few sections of the bill here. Okay. Um, so last two sections of the bill are about body cameras and section six requires the department to outfit um, the Vermont State Police with body cameras um, and the last section seven second to last section has that um, sort of funding language about any ongoing costs of those devices that can't be accommodated within DPS's budget should be included in their budget proposal in August. So I know that you've heard quite a bit of testimony about, um, about the associated policy that should, um, that should be adopted. And I would just point out that in S-124, there is one of the amendments, there is a requirement that um, law enforcement adopt the LAAB model policy um, that was developed after um, that, that act was passed in 2016. So that's, that's where that issue stands on the Senate side. Maxine. Thank you. So uh, I think this is what we were talking about earlier. I know I heard concerns about the um, LEAB model policy and looking more towards um, ACLU and others. And um, this is what we were talking about earlier, somehow getting a policy first and um, so maybe, you know, looking at the language, maybe in section seven, do an A and a B, maybe something like in on section seven, A could be the Department of Public Safety shall initiate. So maybe take out immediately the acquisition, um, maybe change, you know, FY 21 to 22, and then B somehow come up with a process to, um, you know, to get a get a policy with folks, you know, who we think should be part of it, or you know, I don't know what, but um, but somehow lay it out in here. Uh, so throwing that out. I think that makes a lot of sense, um, Tom Burdett. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of the same thing as far as um, I mean with. Uh, uh, Section six, we're handing out the equipment and section seven, we're doing the funding, but we have, we have no policy. And, and I, I think someplace in here, uh, we need to, uh, the way this is written, we got the cart before the horse. Um, the, uh, to me, the policy, I, I guess, it, you know, get the equipment. We've got, if we've got the money for the equipment, this is just my personal opinion, get the equipment, get it ready to go. Uh, get some training on how to use it, and uh, but before it's implemented, um, we need a policy. And 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 the in the commissioner's ten point plan, he he talks about uh, putting a policy together. And and if I remember right, it also mentions uh, you know getting the uh, community members involved in um, in writing that policy. But uh, yeah, uh, the policy needs. To, getting a policy in place to me needs to be in the bill. And, and it certainly needs to be um, uh, written before the, the cameras are handed out to the, to the officers. Um, I think that's just common sense. John Gannon. 
Thank you. Um, I agree that there needs to be a policy in here. I, I think the question is who should be in charge of that policy. We did hear testimony from the ACLU um, that their comments with respect to the LEAB policy were, were rejected. And so putting the Department of Public Safety in, in charge of this process, I think would not be appropriate unless there's legislative oversight um, to approve that policy. Thank you, Selena. I strongly agree, Representative Gannon, that's the exact same point I was gonna make and raise. And um, so I think the who we put um, in the um, both the creation role and the oversight role of that policy is really critical. And um, yes, I would argue against uh, that being DPS or uh, even maybe the criminal um, just a streaming council and looking to uh, a broader authority. And I think there, um, that there is potentially a really important role for the um, racial disparities in criminal and juvenile justice panel here um, and others. But I, I strongly agree with Representative Gannon's comments. Um, so let's uh, let's give some thought between now and our noon session about who we want to be a part of that process because I've asked Tanya Marshall, who is the um, who is with the Secretary of State's office, to come and uh, and talk with us about uh, body cam data policy. Um, and I guess I would ask the question of the two committees: Does it make sense to you to direct? the uh, Secretary of State's office to, to be the convener um, of, of this group. And anyone wanna jump in on that? Selena, what do you think? Um, I, I, I think they have really important input to um, into the parts of this policy that would intersect with um, public records and as a as a librarian and former archivist um, I think they would bring a, a lot of objectivity to the practice but I worry that there's a whole other part of this policy and this work where we need to really hear from um, impacted communities from marginalized folks from folks who have been historically um, disproportionately impacted by policies like these because yes, this is a policy that will provide more transparency about what police are doing, but it also is another tool for policing. Um, and so uh, the process to my mind really, really needs to um, include a, a lot of a lot of people who can bring different perspectives um, beyond just the question of how we're gonna access this as a public record. And so I think that would be, maybe that's a question for um, Tanya when she joins us as to what extent they would feel comfortable facilitating a process that's really broader than public records, simply public yep. records. Yep, absolutely. Barbara? Hey. Takes me a minute to unmute. So lots of states have body cam laws, so it might be important for us to see who, what bodies did those. I do think we need to um, set the parameters for it and agree that if we don't give a, um, a chance for people to really give meaningful input, we're gonna have problems. The one issue that is, I don't think has come up at all unless it came up the day I've been here, we already have police that are using body cameras. So they're totally being unregulated right now. And that's concerning. So it's not all hypothetical about let's get the cameras ready. They're being used now. And I just wanna remind both committees of that. Thanks Barbara. Jim Harrison. Yeah, hi, um, Madam Chair, I'm sorry to be the party pooper here, but um, we just missed the uh, explanation and vote on the yield bill coming back from the Senate and the capital bill coming back from the Senate, both of which are important pieces of legislation. And I'm feeling like I'm a member of appropriations now who often miss these things. So I would just encourage us to 
Um, you know, I don't know what else is being taken up on the floor. Um, I just would hate to miss important legislation as we just have. Uh, I do agree with some of the conversation about convening some kind of stakeholder group. Um, it, it would be hard for us to establish a policy and stick it into this bill right now. Um, but I do think that conversation needs to continue from various stakeholders. Good point. Uh, Hal Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to explore a public-private partnership, uh, uh, possibly including the Secretary of State, but a non-governmental um, social justice organization that's statewide with capacity to convene uh, a process for getting input into development policy. All right. Um, so let's uh, let's take a pause here at this point. Um, I know that we've gone over into the floor time and many of us would like to be able to participate in that. Um, so let's uh, let's go ahead and and uh, call that enough for now, um, recognizing that we need to come back to this issue around development of a body cam policy. And we will have time for input on that and committee discussion on that in the, in the, the noon to two timeframe. So uh, Maxine, anything else you want to give people for an assignment to chew on between now and when we reconvene? Well, I, I think thinking about an intent, for sure, um, and uh, I think some folks have offered to um, to think about that. So I think that's important. And uh, Bryn, I'm not sure where if you need to get back to the Senate or of other, um, but at some point, it'd be great to touch base with you. Yep, I can let me know when it's good. Okay, all right, email you. And, um, and I, um, Jim, um, I just want to thank you for bring us back to uh, where we should be on the floor and, and um, making us mindful of that. So I appreciate that. So, okay. See I you all we, on the floor uh, and we'll be back here later.